Well, we've been going through the book of Genesis, and we're finally at a sad passage, chapter 23, where Sarah dies. It's been a very long history for Abraham and Sarah up to this point. We've been following all of their exploits and how God has revealed himself, and he's made a covenant, and he's showed himself. We see where Sarah laughs when she's informed that she's going to have a child in her old age to an old man. And God brings about a miracle and brings Isaac. It's an, it's an amazing journey, and there's so much to, to learn. You guys enjoying going through Genesis? Because yes. I'm enjoying it. It's just absolutely wonderful. And the Lord is ministering to my heart. So, And even in the death of Sarah, uh, there are things to learn in this chapter. And <coughs> Excuse me. It's kind of an interruption in between 22 and 24 where Isaac actually gets a bride, and there's all sorts of wonderful gems in there as well. But let's see if we can uh, go through the, the scripture. I don't know why I put that up every week. You know where you are. <laughs> Last week, we looked at one of the quintessential pictures of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, where God asks Abraham to take his son, his only son, Isaac, and bring him to a mountain that he would show him and there slay him because God asked him to. I don't know how you guys would do if the Lord asked you to take your child, your only child, and it's interesting he would call him that because he did have another one. This is one of his many tests that he goes through, leaving his loved ones, which he didn't do such a great job, leaving uh, Lot and all of his things. We looked at last week, we just kind of went over all of the things that we see him go through, you know, I'll bet you, you have a story very similar where God puts you to the test to see what's inside of you and what's going to come out. And it's like toothpaste, you know. Once, once the squeeze is on, you get to see what's inside. And it can't go back in, at least not hygienically. So why... Is he testing him? Why are we tested? Well, we're tested for the purification of our faith, for the perfection of our character, and for our protection from sin. God tests us in little things. It's like a child, you know. The, a child has to learn how to, you know, walk. And then they have to learn how to tie shoes and all of those things. And we're the same way. And as we learn these things, and the Lord puts us through what we think are sometimes the most traumatic trials, they're for our good. We don't necessarily see that. And the interesting thing is what Abraham went through was for our good. Because he takes his son, his only son, and goes to sacrifice him. And we see a dress rehearsal of Jesus Christ coming. Where God actually fulfills what he told Abram to do and stopped him. And he actually does by sending his son for us as a sacrifice. So that's why God tests us. Now he doesn't tempt us. You know, each one is tempted one of their own desire. They're lured away and enticed. And then when, when that temptation is given birth, it gives birth to sin. And then sin gives birth to death. That's temptation. That's a different thing. And I think sometimes the only difference is really how we react. Because tests always end up in a victory. And temptations always end up in a failure. Um, at least the ones where we fail. They're not God testing us. And so... He takes him on this long journey, and it's a three-day journey. It's interesting. It's three days. And he goes to a place that you and I know as Golgotha, which is the place where Jesus was crucified. And God leads him to that very mountain on purpose. And so he goes and takes him up to be a sacrifice. And it says that he lays the wood on Isaac. And it's rather interesting because just like the cross was laid on Jesus, the wood was laid on the back of Isaac as he went up to this mountain. And Jesus also went up that very same mountain 2,000 years later. And so we see that this represents Jesus Christ being sacrificed. And God did that very thing that day when Jesus came. We see that he was bound on the altar, and we know that he's probably in his early 30s. So I think of another one who was in his early 30s when he was bound. It was Jesus himself. And, you know, m most of the Sunday schools, they show him as a little kid. I don't know, to identify with the children or something, but uh, he was a full-grown man and had to submit to this. The father and the son were both in agreement to do this. 
Jesus said of himself, he says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down willingly. So we see the picture of Jesus through what happens with Isaac, or Itzak, if you want to pronounce it correctly. But I'm not Hebrew, so. We saw God's perfect timing just before he sacrifices his son and goes through with the deed. An angel of the Lord comes and stops him. And we see the angels were involved in encouraging Jesus as he was in the garden, if you remember, came and encouraged him. So it's, there's this pattern that goes throughout the scriptures. And this is how God speaks to us, not in prophecy and fulfillment, but in picture and in shadow and in type. And we see that all throughout the scripture. And so he says, stop, don't do a thing to the lad. And he looks and there's this ram that's caught in a thicket. A ram is a male sheep. Horns are always representative of power. The sheep being stuck in the thorns, the thorns being a picture of what sin has done to the world. If you remember, thorns and thistles, the ground was infested with in chapter three when man fell. And Jesus wears a crown of thorns upon his own head when he's on the cross. So we saw all of these similarities. We went into it last week. I'm sure that none of this is boring, but I'm sure it's review for you. And this prophetic look at what God told him to do. And he, he says, because you have not with held your son, your only son. And it's interesting, those words kind of ring in our ears when we read it in the Old Testament because we know the fulfillment of it is in Christ. John 3, 16, God gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so it says that it, he was finished and he came down the mountain. And it's interesting that the scripture is silent about Isaac. Now, it's not that he wasn't there. I, I'm sure he was there. But the scripture is silent about Isaac, and we don't see him until next week when he takes a bride, which I think is very prophetic because what happened with Christ was he was sacrificed by the Father, and we don't see him now. But when he comes to get his bride, we will see him again. Amen? Amen. So scripture, there again, pictures, all, always through the scripture. And so we looked at the setup in the rest of the chapter, which is we're looking forward to Rebecca. Rebecca is going to be married to Isaac, and that brings us to this chapter. So we're going to look at the death of Sarah. You remember her name means princess, so it's really the death of the princess. It brings to mind Princess Diana when she died. It's... Uh, Abraham is mourning because his wife died. And that's something that, I, you know, we're all going to have to face, either our own death or someone we love. And it's really difficult. I'm not sure that we're equipped naturally to be able to deal with it because death is not a natural thing. I believe God created our bodies to regenerate and for us to continue to live long after uh, when we give up the ghost. But we're going to look at Sarah dying. So let's look at the passage Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and weep for her. It's a, an interesting thing. She's the only woman in the Bible where her age is given at, when she dies. Nobody else is given that honor. It's actually an honor. Um, there are women who are buried and we're told about, but never giving their age in the entirety. So she's the only one, which is kind of interesting, right? Ecclesiastes 3 says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. It's interesting that Planting and plucking is right after living and dying because I feel like the Lord does that. He just plucks us up. We're planted here. We get settled here. We like it here. We get deeply rooted here, and then the Lord is going to pull us up. But there's always time for those things. And it's one of those things that's really difficult to talk about. I feel like I'm doing a funeral service because we're talking about the death of Sarah. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, it says a good name is better than precious ointment. The day of death than the day of one's birth. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, 
and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. You notice a word that continually flows through that passage. It's the heart. God's concerned with our heart. Much laughter that we look at and enjoy usually is at the expense of someone else, isn't it? If I were to trip and fall off here, some of you would laugh and some of you would go, oh. see, there's the laughter. <laughs> Whose expense? <laughs> laughter is very often at someone else's expense. And so when the Bible says that, that mourning is better than laughter, I'm like, well, what, are you kidding me? Because it changes the heart. There are real things that people deal with at a funeral that they don't deal with Friday night out at the bar. Parties are nice, but usually what's talked about is kind of frivolous and passing. You think about what's talked about at funerals. You get to see people you haven't seen for the longest time, people that come from far away. It's one of the only reasons that your family gets together usually, either weddings or funerals. And so you have this opportunity to kind of remember, wow, I have relationships with these people. We have history with these people. You know, why don't we keep in touch anymore? You know, why are we just Facebook, one of the 50,000 Facebook friends? And we get to think about really what's important and the fact that every funeral you go to, you know you're thinking about your funeral because we're all going to take a turn in the front of the room. So thinking about that day makes me live today better. Amen? Amen. And so the day of your death is better than the day of your birth. You caused a lot of trouble on the day you were born. And it says a good name, and hopefully when you die and you have a good name, there's a reputation that you pass off. There's a witness for Jesus Christ that people know, understand, and it has changed them. That is what is better than any ointment that you can get. So that's the way Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon looks at it. Psalm 103, verses 13 to 16 says, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. That's what God made man from, by the way, dust. And it's also what the serpent will eat all the days of his life. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it and is gone, and its place remembers it no more. There'll be a time when you and I pass from this life and we'll stand before God and have to give an account of the deeds done in the body. I'm glad that the only thing that I'm going to stand for is believing in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Because without that, no one has any hope. In Ephesians 5.28, it says, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's not just a commercial for you guys not just Dave's opportunity to remind you of this. Abraham was so united with his wife, he mourned. The fact that we come to know Jesus Christ, that there's a hope after this life, that we enjoy abundant life and, and more abundantly because Christ came, doesn't mean we don't sorrow. But there's a way to sorrow, and then there's a way to get into a depression and become suicidal. I'm not advocating that. But there is a proper way to mourn a loss and to loss uh, the loss of a life. And I think that we should. And we see Abraham demonstrates that here in this passage. First Thessalonians says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's a nice Christian way of saying died. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. It's one of the only passages that says you should comfort one another with these words. There are all kinds of words that we can use, but the scripture directs us to remember this, which is our hope. So when we mourn, we don't mourn without hope. We mourn as those who have hope. Amen? Amen. Because of Jesus. Because he came and tasted death for all of us. He paid the price so that I could be redeemed because there is no amount of good things that I can ever do to undo the evil that I have done and the evil that lies in my heart. Amen? Amen. I hope you all know that for sure. Isaiah 51, 1 and 2 talks about Sarah as being a good example for us to follow. And Isaiah 51, 1 and 2 says, Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. So we have something to learn from Abraham and Sarah, from all that they've been through and everything that God has done. It says that we should look to them and learn, a chip off the old block, so to speak. Hebrews 11:11 11, 11 in the New Testament says, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised You see, she's an example of what it is to believe God contrary to how you feel, contrary to circumstances, contrary to what you think or even logic sometimes would dictate because God overrides all that and he does miraculous things, right? I I know he has in my life and and I'm, I'm praise God for that. So she's praised because she's full of faith, faithful. That's actually what the word means, to be full of faith. It usually has something to do with doing the same repeated action over and over as you said you would. And that's the way we take it. But really at its core, it means to be full of faith. And Sarah is said to be full of faith in Hebrews. 1 Peter 3, wives, you probably love this passage. Some of you know it, yes. It says, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. And even if some do not obey the word, it doesn't say they're believers or unbelievers, by the way. It says that they don't believe the word. In other words, they're not doing what's right. They, meaning the husbands, without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Ladies, I will tell you as a husband, your greatest weapon is not your words. Because the scripture says that. You see, I'm, I'm bold to say that. Because the scripture says that. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, respect, awe, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be of the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Sarah is lifted up as an example of what it is to submit to a knucklehead. Not because he's a knucklehead, but because of her place where God has called her to be. And in so doing, she submits to God. For me to love my wife is an expression of worship to God as I love my wife. For her to submit to me, even though she doesn't agree with everything I say, and quite often she's right. I'll just say that so you ladies will open your ears to me. It's true. It is true. Quite often she's right. Sometimes she's more perceptive than I am. She understands people's feelings. She understands when I say something that's offensive up here and she lets me know, you know, 
you said that thing today. It's like, what do you mean? I didn't say that. Oh, you did. Let's go to the videotape. And then she plays it. And yes, I did. And I'm like, wow. So, and I pray for God's forgiveness and I pray that you would forget it. So, she's an example and she's beautiful. She's full of beauty. And she's extolled as being a beautiful woman. We know that she was desirable. I mean, she didn't have like glowing dark hair like my wife, maybe. But I, I can see my wife all the way across the room. I'm so glad she grew it up because now I can see her. But she's beautiful and she was beautiful. She was full of beauty because of her submissive heart, because of her gentle and quiet spirit. She didn't argue with her words. Can you imagine... Hey, we're moving. Where are we going? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? The Lord said that I should go to a place that he'll show me. He goes, well, did he show you yet? No. But pack up. We're going. She didn't go, what? You know, she didn't give any of that. She went. And she followed, which is amazing. And called him master. Now, ladies, I, I don't advise calling your husband master. <laughs> if he has a pride problem, it's, it, it's all over. But... Being respectful, I think, is the point. Verse 3, And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, this is the neighborhood, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince. It's interesting. Her name means princess. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you his burial place that you may bury your dead. You see, this promised land that God had promised to give to him was not his yet. There are people that lived there. And he's asking permission to be able to have some property to bury his wife. Uh, any, any of you have a plot selected for yourself with a lovely view you'll never see? <laughs> Near a babbling stream you'll never hear? But it might be nice and an encouragement for other people to come. I would advise you get something near a pond that's stocked and you will probably get more visitors that way. Stocked with trout, with fish. Then you can visit and my wife would never visit me, but anyway. So he asked the neighborhood, listen, I, my wife died unexpectedly at 127, and I need a place to bury my dead, and I want to, to buy a piece of property. And he tells him, I want to buy a piece of property. This isn't just a gift. He, he, he wants to settle in. Now, it's interesting because God gave him the land. Why does he have to buy it? I'll let that gnaw at the back of your mind. Verse 7. So Abraham stood up and he bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth, and he spoke to them saying, if it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and meet with Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me, at the full price, you see, he's buying it, not getting it as a gift, as property for a burial place among you. It's interesting. He's going up and saying, I need to buy some property. And they said, listen, take anything that you want. It's yours. We're not going to stand in your way. You're a mighty prince. You're, you're all that in a bag of chips, and you got people and cattle, and you know, you're, you're loaded. So we're glad to have you here because it means business for everybody else. So go anywhere you want. Abraham bows his face down to them. That's a good, respectful way to approach people, don't you think? There's a lot of good business models in here. If you need something from somebody, it would be good if you weren't just go up and demand it, right? You ask, and you do it with a deep reverence and respect. And Abraham does that. And he, he makes sure that he has something in mind because he tells them, well, listen, I do see a piece of property, and I see Machpelah, which actually means double blessing. It's a double cave, so it's a his and hers. You know, it's a double plot. That's what Machpelah means. 
He says, I found one, and I want you to talk to Ephron because Ephron owns this property, and I'll be glad to buy it from him. Now Ephron dwelt among the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in his presence of the sons of Heth. It's always good to get a witness. All who entered at the gate of the city, saying, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you. Bury your dead. Forget about it. Just go do it. I'll give it to you. He goes, No, I want to pay you. No, I'm giving it to you. So, what do you do? It's interesting. Abraham wants to pay for it. God's promised him this land. And he's got a guy that's willing to give it to him. But he doesn't want to just take it as a gift. You know what the problem with taking gifts is? I'm sorry? Well, you might owe something if you, if you have a heart of reciprocation. Yeah, you might feel like you... But there's strings. There are strings attached. Listen, you get, a, you get an ugly sweater from Aunt Ethel and... By golly, it doesn't fit you, and it's itchy, and it smells like something. And you say, thank you for the lovely Christmas gift that you gave me. And you promptly put it away. Hermetically seal it so it doesn't infect the rest of your clothing with that smell. <laughs> but when she visits, you take it out. And you don't dare give it away because, my goodness, if she happens to be at the local Goodwill and finds it hanging there, she'll be heartbroken. Gifts can be a very complicated matter, and there are usually strings attached, right? It's like your parents say, congratulations, you're married. I bought you a house. Really? Amazing. It's right next to ours. <laughs> like my big fat Greek wedding. I accepted a gift of an apartment from my father-in-law, and he gave it to me free of rent for a year. I said, this is cool. And it took me three months to fix it up because there were holes in the ceiling, there was blood on the walls, the floor looked like the ocean. I was like, what happened here? Oh, there were kids playing in a pool upstairs. <laughs> strings. There are strings. And then, of course, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law had a key, and they would help themselves to just come in as I was a newlywed which could be embarrassing when someone's in your home and you have not arisen from bed yet. <laughs> so there are always strings. Be careful of accepting gifts because there can be strings attached. You guys know this, right? Just tell me you understand. Good. So go to Ephron and talk to him for me because he's got this piece of land that I'm interested in. So there's Ephron. Then Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people. So he's going to ask again. He's going to bow down on the ground again. Here's an aged man bowing down on his knees. I don't know about you, but my knees are not great. He does this because he's showing respect, saying, if you will give it, please hear me. I will give you money for the field. Take it from me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. My land is worth eh, 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So go bury your dead. When somebody says, I'm going to give you a gift, and they put a price tag on it, It's like, hey, man, uh, you bought me coffee at Starbucks. Thanks. I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I feel indebted to you. No, 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 it's okay. What's $5.75 between friends? <laughs> Five, yeah, you know I'm counting out every penny because uh, I, don't, I don't. When somebody puts a price tag on the gift they give you, that's a hint. There are strings, right? But the funny thing is, He's not just selling him the cave now. He's selling him a giant parcel of land. These guys, the Hittites, were slick. Said, ah, oh, he wants a place to bury his dead, huh? Okay. Well, it's a parcel. It, it goes with the land. 
with all the acres of land and the trees that are around it. It all goes together. It's a parcel. And it's, you know, 400 shekels. By the way, you guys don't deal in shekels with silver anymore, right? This is an extraordinarily high amount. This is what they do. If you've ever been over there and you go through a bazaar and you say, how much is this? They say $50. And you go, oh, that's too much. They go, no, 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 wait. No, grab your shirt. No, no, don't go away. Don't go away. What? 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 For you, 45 Oh, no, it's still too No, wait, 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 wait. They grab you. They forcibly will tug you over. You can get them down to 20, 15. So this is a negotiation skill, and you guys may have run into this sort of thing. If you go to open-air markets or anything, I'm remembering. So it happens. So Ephron says, yeah, um, it's 400 shekels, but, you know, what's that between you and me? That's, that's like nothing. Well, it's something, especially since you named your price. And Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth. 400 shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. And so the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave, which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, which were within all the surrounding borders, are deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth before all who went in at the gate of the city. So this was a big public ceremony, and Abraham wanted to make sure that he bought this property so it couldn't be taken from him, you see? Also, it's a little bit of a tax shelter because he owns the property. Nobody's going to take it away from him. And he wanted to make sure he paid. Notice he didn't come back with a counter bid. Notice he didn't try to get him down. You and I might do that at a flea market, right? Or at a garage sale. Hey, how much for this? A dollar. Would you take 75 cents? You ever have people do that? I've had garage sales. I've had people do that. How much for this? 25 cents. Would you take 10 cents? You don't have a quarter? Really? Are you that? Uh, hey, if you're poor, I understand. No, no, it's just, you know, here, here's the quarter. Yeah. You can get all manipulative. But anyway, he does not counter. He's buying this property in a land that the Lord said, listen, I gave you all this land. It's all yours. But he's buying it to make sure that it's his property. You know, it's the only piece of property Abraham buys. Because he lives in tents. He's an alien and a stranger, and he's always wandering. He never settles down. But he bought this to bury Sarah. So, 2 Samuel 24, if I can not make mistakes. In 2 Samuel 24, David was buying a piece of property, which you understand it now as being the Dome of the Rock. It was the threshing floor of Aruna. And as he went there, the same sort of a situation happened. And Aruna said, listen, you can have it. You're the king. You can have this property. And not only that, I'm going to give you a bunch of cattle and stuff because you're going to make sacrifice and give thanks to God. And we're going to seal the deal, the exchange of the property. And so I'm going to give you all this land and I'm going to give you all this cattle. It says here in 2 Samuel 24, the king said to Aruna, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which cost me nothing. David did not want to give God a cheap gift that cost him nothing. Because what kind of sacrifice is that? That's why giving is encouraged in the scripture. Giving is one of those things that separates our selfishness from ourselves. Because for you to give, I mean, some people it's easier to give than others. Some people are like, hurry up, take it before I change my mind. And then there are other people that just give, and then you just feel funny in front of them because, you, you know. Giving separates selfishness from me. And it's one of those things that's encouraged in the New Testament. Tithing was a mandatory in the Old Testament, 10%. That's what tithe means. I don't, I, I don't check on you guys well. 
Bill, tell me, who's, who's given 10% around here? <laughs> who, who are the big tithers here? I have no idea who, who contributes anything to this church. I have no clue. I'm completely out of it. Bill knows everything. I don't know anything. I'm pleased to be that way because it doesn't give me chances to think or show favoritism. So I'm free. If I treat you nice, it's because I like you. <laughs> and after that, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, that is Hebron. Notice it has a new name, Hebron, which means fellowship. Machpelah means double cave or double blessing before Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Heth as property for a burial place. Isn't it interesting? We find this in the book of Genesis. It's like a title deed. Hey, Abraham owns his property. He paid for it. Interestingly, this is what they built on top of it. It's a mosque. And you have, because Ishmael also is an offspring of Abraham, you have Muslims and Jews that meet in this place and they have separate sides where they might view these buildings that have uh, what, what is understood to be the remains of those who are there. And it's, uh, it, it was a problem. <laughs> it tends to be problematic. Hebron is a very war-torn area. And um, there's this giant mosque right over the caves. And the caves are underground, by the way. So if you go there and you see these little edifices, like these little stone homes with windows and bars across them, you think you're looking at a sepulcher, but it's underground. It's actually underneath there. So you never see anything like that. And if you go online, you can see... I find it very interesting. But So he bought it. And the funny thing is, it's, it's not a Jewish place. It's the burial place of Abraham as well later on when he dies and Sarah. Isaac and Rebekah both are planted here and Jacob and Leah. It's interesting because Rachel dies and she's actually in Bethlehem. So there's a scripture that says in Rachel weeping and she would not be comforted about Bethlehem, the, the death of the innocents when Jesus was born. Anyway, so it's interesting. You've got these couples and it's Machpelah, which means double blessing or double cave. And so you have these couples that are actually buried here, which is rather interesting. I think it's interesting. So it's the burial place of all of these couples. And by the way, this is what it looks like from above. It's very lavish on the inside and it's just very stark on the outside, but the caves are actually underneath. And you can see this was all built on rock. Uh, if you go to the area of Hebron, uh, this is it. In Mark chapter 12, verses 26 to 27, kind of is anticlimactic if you're going to go visit this place. It says, but concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. Jesus is trying to correct the Sadducees who don't believe in a resurrection. And he's saying, well, why would God say that he is currently the God of all of these folks, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Because he's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living, which tells us that these folks are living and they're not here. So any grave you go to, they're not there. It's like finding shells on, on, the, on the seashore. Nobody home. They're not there. And I, I'm glad that Jesus straightened that out for us. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave in the field of Machpelah before Mamre in Hebron. This is the field and its cave are dated to Abraham by the sons of Heth. You remember when they first went into the land, when Moses came over the Red Sea and they go into the land and they wander around for 40 years in the wilderness and then Joshua brings them over the Jordan and they finally get into the promised land and they're all circumcised and then they recover and they go in. They send spies. They send them into the land to scour the land and they come back and they bring this giant thing of grapes and they say, this land is awesome. It's, it's wonderful, but 
the people are giants. We don't dare go in there because we're, we're like little people. And so they go into this land where all these giants are. It's an interesting thing how you have these warlike men who are giants that live there. The Anakites were later mentioned briefly in the book of Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges. Caleb, one of the 12 spies sent by Moses into Canaan, later drove out the descendants of Anak, his three sons, from Hebron. This is the place that we're looking at today. So he's in the neighborhood with these people, the sons of Anak, his three sons from Hebron, also called Kiriath Arba, uh, also called Kiriath Arba, which means the, t- the town of Arba. It's the same place. Numbers 13, 33 says, we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak that came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, so that we were in, and so we were in, their, in our own sight. They went in and found all these giants, and where did they live? In Hebron. That's where Sarah and Abraham and all these guys are buried. They're right in the middle of enemy territory. And there are giants there. I just thought that was amazing because when I saw Hebron, I was like, wait a minute, isn't that the place where the giants are? And it is. And we see later on. Anakim were the standard by which all other giants were compared. In fact, they were the they were the largest of the people, and everybody else was compared, you know. Oh, they, they weren't as big as them. They were a little bit smaller, but bigger than me, you know. That's how we describe people, right? Like, you know, so-and-so from church, you know, they're a little bit kind of, you know, this color and this size. Anyway, that's the way I talk about you. Anyway, in Deuteronomy 2, 10 to 11, says the, the Emim had dwelt there in times of past, and people are great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. So they were like the, the limit of height. And were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites call them Amim. So everybody calls them a different name, but they were giants. In Hebron, it seems to be the location where they were. And if you remember David and his exploits with Goliath, you remember where Goliath was from? He was from Gath. It just so happens that Gath is right up the street from Hebron. So there's this region of the world where you've got giants who are now uh, part of this. And it's interesting, when Jacob dies or when he's dying, he says, listen, don't leave my bones here. Take them out of here and go plant them. So his bones actually get brought there and planted, but he dies elsewhere. It's, It's real interesting. And he said, I don't want you to find a wife for my son back where I'm from in Ur of the Chaldees, and I definitely don't want you to choose one from around here. There's this protection of the DNA, the protection of this line to the Messiah that is being made sure, and I'm not sure he even knew he was doing it. So we know about David and Goliath and how he takes, takes him down. In Joshua 15, it says, Now to Caleb, the sons of Jephunneh, he gave a share among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kirjath Arba, which you know as Hebron, which is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. So we see later on, you, you know about Caleb. Caleb was the only one that had any real guts, him and Joshua. There was a section of land that they couldn't conquer and they couldn't get in. He goes, that's hill country, man. I can handle that. And he was an old man already. But he was, and the thing is, he went in and he cleaned up and he got them all out. And it's interesting, these are the same people. This is in Hebron, the same place where Abraham and Sarah and everyone else is buried in this, in this place. So I thought that was really interesting, this, this Kirjath Arba, which means the town of Arba, for those of you who are not, you know, Bible scholars. So next week... We're going to look at getting a wife for Isaac or Isaac, which sounds funny to say. Sarah dies. Suddenly, Isaac has to be married. And at this point, he's 37 years old. They really held on to them for a long time. I don't know if you got married when you were young. I know I did. 
And uh, my kids got married when they were young, and I'm glad for that, because I can be a young grandpa. <laughs> As we look at this, and we look at the, the pairing up of Isaac with his wife, Rebecca, we're going we're gonna to see some beautiful things, some more picture and some more prophecy about what I think the Lord wants to show us. And as we're looking back at it, we're going to see all sorts of really interesting parallels to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.